I think we've got a full day today because we're talking about pollinators and Scott has a lot of information to share with us. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Scott, and let you start, just rip right in. All right, uh, let me get my screen shared and get my, my slides started. <clears throat> let's see here. While we're waiting, Jeff, I just wanna point out to you that I have a flower microphone. Yes, you do. <laughs> and so I just wanted to up the game of the show tonight. <laughs> yeah i'm jealous i don't have a flower microphone so. i can't tell you how to do it but i have one <laughs> it's it's better than turning yourself into a potato i understand I, that's what i understand <laughs> so where do we start here scott well uh pollinators are a big subject uh and today we'll we'll try to talk about uh ones that uh, are pretty common on flowers in wyoming and what you might see when you're out and about looking at flowers uh, both people and insects are attracted to flowers for different reasons so uh <clears throat> first we should probably talk a little bit just to define pollination and you know there's there's a lot of plants that are wind pollinated they don't require uh insects at all there are some plants that uh, they can be self fertile uh, or uh, they benefit some from pollination, but they don't require it. And then there's others that actually have to have uh, a, a pollinator, whether it's an, uh, an animal uh, such as an insect or uh, a hummingbird or something like that, that visits the flower and then transfers the pollen from the anther uh, uh, via uh, physically uh, whether they collect it on their body, uh, their hairs, or, or in uh, pollen baskets, and then they visit another flower of the same species and, and get that pollen on the stigma, which goes down and, and uh, forms the seeds. So, you know, it's pretty critical for uh, the plants. <clears throat> so it's, that pollination is basically the reproduction, the sexual reproduction of the plants. And so, Various plants have different methods, but we're going to specifically talk about that physical transfer uh, use of insects, correct? Yes, yeah. That, uh, today we'll just concentrate on that because, like I said, it's, there's, there's a, it's, that's pretty simple because there's a lot of variations, but it, because it, it, it's been going on for such a long time, uh, there has been these uh, variations developed. But some of the stuff remains kind of constant. Uh, in the fossil record, you see insects here like this. A butterfly uh, uh, that you know you can actually see the pattern on the wings even uh, the the very similar to species that are still around today and then here's a, a flower and this goes back to the uh, uh, origin of them uh, and this is also uh, why insects became so diverse because the plants uh, diversified and then insects that could pollinate or feed on those plants also followed suit. So very important in our world today uh, with the diversity of plants and animals that we have. The, the flowers that uh, use animals are generally arranged physically. So the critter, like in this case, this is a green bottle fly that's visiting this flower, uh, is getting dusted with pollen when visiting. And so the next uh, flower it visits of the same species it transfers that pollen and you get uh, uh, seed production. <clears throat> so Scott, and, we don't traditionally think of flies as pollinators, but they are, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Especially in the mountainous regions of Wyoming, a lot of times you, you have a lot of the pollination of the little uh, uh, flowers up there in the Alpine region that uh, will be visited by flies. And so, yep, they're, they're uh, and you often don't think of the, what we, often referred to as filth flies as being pollinators, but that's the, they utilize decaying organic matter for their larva, but the adults will feed on nectar at flowers. And so uh, uh, they, they are good pollinators. <clears throat> and that's probably gonna be the, the highlight of this show is expanding my knowledge, but also probably our participants knowledge on, on what actually classifies as a pollinator. And a lot of insects that do a heavy bulk of pollination is not what we typically think of. So at least for me, traditionally, I think of butterflies, right? And, yeah, butterflies uh, and bees. bees. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. So That's that, not that, it. <laughs> That's not it. Oh, already failed this morning. <laughs> 
Yeah, so the, like I said, the insects and the plants have been doing this a very long time, and, and some of it is, is uh, you know, specialization going on, whether it's specialized structures like the, uh, the proboscis, or, or you can think of it as a tongue on this specimen, uh, has been unfurled, and so it's able to uh, hover in front of a long tubular flower and put that proboscis down there to feed on nectar, and in the process will get pollen on that proboscis. You have other things like this little yucca moth, where it, it is the only effective pollinator of uh, like uh, the yucca plants because uh, other insects will visit yucca flowers, uh, but they are not pollinated. You know, the, the long-term relationship between this little moth and yucca is what they depend on for each other. You also have uh, specialized behavior. Uh, bumblebees do a thing called buzz pollination. And, and so they're critical for, uh, this is on a tomato flower, to get that pollen to release because uh, uh, the, the pollen is held pretty tightly uh, on the flower and they'll vibrate. And uh, so even in a hothouse tomato production, they have uh, bring in bumblebees because they're so efficient at getting pollination and good uh, fruit set from the tomato plants. And then sometimes, the, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. The buzz pollination is kind of interesting because normally insects, if they have a, a pitch when they fly, the, the sound is the same. And then when these things land on uh, tomato flowers and do the buzz pollination, it, uh, the pitch of that flight sound that we're used to ch actually changes. So cool. they're, they're, yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah, there's, there's some uh, great videos uh, online that you can search for the buzz pollination and they have them lit so you can see the just the explosion of pollen that comes off the flower when, when the insect does that. In some cases, it's not necessarily pollen, uh, which is protein-rich food, that in some cases the insects are gathering for their own food, but in the process, you know, there's enough pollen transferred that it's effective. Uh, uh, it can be nectar, which is a sweet, uh, often fragrant uh, fluid substance that they will feed on. But in the case like these are orchid bees uh, that uh, are found in uh, South America feeding on an orchid that provides an essential oil uh, to that the bees utilize. And so, uh, like I say, lots of stuff going on between plants and uh, their pollinators. Now, <clears throat> as I use these terms today, I'll, I'll, I, I need to define them a little bit. Uh, insect orders are the major groupings of insects uh, that uh, uh, are defined by sharing common traits, like the Coleoptera, which I think was named by Aristotle, uh, refers to their front wings have been modified into the shield-like coverings on their body. And so that's, uh, they all have this uh, uh, modified front wing as adults. Uh, in the case of say like the Diptera or the true flies, their uh, front two wings uh, have, uh, been maintained for flight and their hind wings have been modified into these structures called halteers. <clears throat> so just to, to define it, so the order Hymenoptera, which contains bees, ants, wasps, and soft flies, uh, has what could be considered the superstars of pollination. Uh, those are uh, members of the super family of Poidia, which includes uh, the honeybee, like this is an Italian honeybee. I should have got a picture of one with uh, pollen on its basket but I uh, uh, didn't, uh, but I do have, uh, a, a, it's a scanning electron micrograph of the branched hairs that are on the body of, of the bees, and uh, they help grab the pollen, and they also uh, will carry a static charge that helps grab the pollen, so they can collect it, groom themselves, and pack it into their pollen basket. So uh, uh, the behavior uh, is a key, and then all these, uh, specializations that they've got help them gather pollen. I was going to ask you, Scott, I just, I just can't help it, but how do you know that's an Italian honeybee and not a French one? 
Well, yeah. that's what the caption is. <laughs> said. <laughs> I, I'm just joking. I'm teasing Scott. Uh, just, it just, it just struck me as humorous yeah. today. <laughs> I could probably also tell by its accent when it flew. <laughs> as it flew, yeah. The, the pitch of its buzz. <laughs> yes. Jeremiah, you just couldn't help yourself, could you? I, I couldn't. That one, I just couldn't <laughs> let go. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, it's a rough crowd here. Uh, <laughs> there are multiple families within Apoidea. So Apoidea is a super family, and then uh, insect families all end in this IDAE. And so you have things like uh, the adrenans, which include miners and fairy and, and oxenae bees and, and things like that. Uh, so it's not just honeybees. And, and you know, of course, we also have to consider that the, Euro uh, the honeybees originated in Europe or Eurasia. Uh, and, and so we have all of our native plants evolved with uh, uh, native bees uh, uh, visiting them. And uh, so honeybees can actually, in some cases, be a competitor for our native bees. Uh, <clears throat> but again, here's one, a really interesting one. Uh, they, they're hardworking bees too. Uh, they nest in hard packed bare ground. And uh, they're a digger bee. These, uh, I took pictures out of my driveway of uh, uh, the nest entrance that the female excavates. And then she tunnels down in there and, and makes these little uh, chambers. And then she goes and gathers pollen. And in this case, uh, the only thing that was blooming on the prairie in this dry year uh, were some gold mallow. Uh, and, and so uh, they would work at gathering enough of a pollen that uh, their egg can hatch and develop and, and then remain in there and pupate and not emerge until the following year. And so uh, that's up there. Uh, those are two digger bees making more digger bees. So. so Scott, it was my understanding that actually most of our bees in Wyoming are, they nest in the ground rather than up, you know, in a tree or whatever we might usually think of. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's especially true in, in uh, uh, the grasslands. Uh, and so, you know, ground nesting is really, it's a, a kind of a safe place to be, especially, you know, like with prairie fires or anything like that. Uh, they uh, are also insulated from extremes in temperature. Uh, and, and so, yep, uh, ground nesting is uh, very important. One of the interesting things that I didn't um, realize, uh, you know, a lot of times I water uh, to, to maintain uh, the greenness, uh, some semblance of greenness around my house. And I have a lot of the, the prairie grasses I've tried to encourage to come back. Well, the ground nesting bees, you know, if it's sunny, they will go to work. And then if you turn on the water and drown out their hole, they come back and it's like, uh oh, where's my hole at? You didn't kill them, but you, you know, set them back. And so kind of an interesting thing uh, about them, uh, you know, they take signals from their environment. So if they come out in the morning and it's all cloudy and it looks like it's going to rain, they won't go out and forage that time. And so uh, it's just one of those things to keep in mind. I don't think it really matters on a bluegrass lawn, uh, but uh, if you've got some native uh, vegetation that you're watering, it's probably best to water at the end of the day uh, when they're not active. So again, I have them nest between the pavers in my garden in the unmulched areas. And uh, so I tell people when they're looking around, they're oftentimes a lot closer than you might think, and you just haven't noticed that they're there. And so if you see something that looks like an anthill, a lot of the types that nest where I'm at, they look like little anthills. But if you sit there and watch it and the hole's a little bigger, you can see that there aren't ants coming and going. And so it's pretty common for that to be a bee nest. And yeah. for those bee nests, Scott, do the uh, do they need actual bare ground? So, like alkali bees, what I've read on them is they actually like a really hard packed uh, ground and and exposed ground, very much like a, maybe a two track road or a um, or a dirt road, something along that nature. Is I'm guessing it's not the uniform across all of them. No, it, there, there's variations, you know, like say on some of them, they do like the bare ground, the hard packed. You wouldn't think that they want to excavate into that, uh, but they do, uh, you know, like the alkali bees that you're talking about, uh, they like to have uh, bare ground that has been saturated uh, and often has uh, the crusty alkali salts on it. Uh, and so 
but they're all different. Uh, some of them uh, will, you know, like Jenny was talking about the round flagstones. Some of them will excavate under those. Uh, it's often, you know, when you flip a rock, you'll often see ants that have nested under a, a rock. Uh, it, it might be advantageous for it warming up earlier in the spring due to the, you know, the, the rock acting like a, you know, gathering heat uh, during the day and then releasing it at night. So there's probably things that uh, need to be studied on all of them as far as uh, defining their habitats and, and what they, they need to, to be successful. So again, lots of different bees uh, that are in and that you'll see visiting flowers. Whoops, there we go. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> so bumblebees are ones that are pretty abundant uh, and they're very important for our early season flowers because they can be active uh, early in the spring at temperatures that uh, like uh, Western hun honeybees could not fly at. Uh, generally, Western honeybees don't do much uh, flying or pollinating when air temperatures are below 50 degrees. They just can't maintain their uh, flight muscles at a temperature that can be effective. And so, but bumblebees, because they're big and hairy, and they can uh, essentially shiver uh, and warm their muscles up, uh, they will be out and about when it's very cool. So this is a picture on the past flower. I showed a uh, Hunt's bumblebee. Probably she's a new queen because that's how they're, uh, they overwinter as just queens and then they have to start off all by themselves uh, to, to make a, a nest chamber and, and then provision it with uh, nectar and pollen and, and produce their first brood of daughters all by themselves. <clears throat> You know, some of these others, you know, are, are pretty small uh, and you have to look closely uh, at them to see their identifying characters or to notice them, but they're worth looking at because certainly uh, the sweat bees, some of those are just absolutely beautiful uh, with their uh, iridescent colors. So uh, again, uh, just the diversity of the bees. <clears throat> Well, and those sweat bees, now they're, they're named because they'll actually go harvest sweat. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, uh, from what I've read, and, and I had a colleague when I was in grad school that uh, uh, his sweat seemed to produce a lot of lactic acid, and that's kind of what they are attracted to. Uh, and when we'd be out doing field work, as the day heated up and the bees got going and he started sweating, I'd hear him cussing because the bees would come up and they'll lick with the tongue to collect the sweat. And you know, that kind of tickles. And if you touch them or you get them trapped under your shirt collar, they'll sting you. Uh, so I would hear him swearing about it. But uh, yeah, that's why they're called sweat bees. They actually uh, are attracted to that substance. Yeah, go out with somebody that has that really high <laughs> acidic. Yeah, they, they come after me too. So do they yeah. hang out with Jeff then when you're outdoors? Yeah. Let them get him. <laughs> uh, well, I work slow enough. I never sweated. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other. That's the other uh, trait to to inhibit. <laughs> yeah. Very meticulous. Mm -hmm. So uh, leaf cutters are real common, and a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, we'll see their evidence on plants uh, because they utilize fragments of leaves or petals in order to make little uh, chambers that they'll provision with pollen that they collect on this. Uh, they instead of baskets on their hind legs, they collect uh, on this what's called a scopa. Uh, they have these specialized hairs on the ab bottom of their abdomen, and often it, the color changes as the flowers that they visit and the colors of pollen change. Uh, but again, so the females they make a little chamber with uh, leaf fragments, provision it with a ball of nectar and pollen, uh, uh, and then lay an egg on it and then seal it up and do that over and over again. And that's uh, uh, some of these, like the alfalfa leaf cutting bee is very important for our, our seed production. And then mason bee is, is a, a really good pollinator for our fruit orchards. Uh, and the Xerces Society has some information on trying to encourage uh, uh, them by providing something that uh, uh, they need. And that's uh, cavities. Uh, and so you can utilize things like paper straws, is, uh, cavities that these critters like the nest in. Boy, if I didn't know any better, if you didn't say that, Scott, I mean, at a quick glance, I might have even thought that was a fly, not even think it was a bee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See his fuzzy eyebrow? 
<laughs> yeah, I do see it now. <laughs> I don't I don't look at the eyebrows right away when I look at an insect there, Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I did mention, you know, the, the true flies have two functional wings, and this is a member of Hymenoptera. They have four functional wings, but their hind wing is smaller, and it's connected to their front wing with these little hooks. And so functionally, they act like two wings, but they uh, if you look at them closely under magnification or, or, or uh, you know, rip them apart, they are uh, four-winged. Well, the uh, life of an entomologist, ripping wings <laughs> off of insects to identify them. Oh, it gets worse than that. <laughs> uh, sure. uh, so so uh, megachylids also will nest in um, uh, structures similar to what the mason bee has set up. Uh, and so um, wh where I live, uh, we had to take out a lot of uh, cottonwood trees when we first moved in and, and I had some laying in various orientation around my property. And all those that had a fout, uh, excuse me, south facing uh, uh, the way that they were laying uh, were inhabited by leaf cutter bees. They would come in, they would cut holes into the log and then they would nest in the log. So uh, it, it, they will make their own nests if you don't make nests for them. So they're kind of they're kind of cool to have around. At my house they will um, nest in the ground which I thought was kind of funny because it's mm. not what you usually think of with a leaf cutter. Yeah, well, we, we have a lot of leaf cutters up here in the Bighorn Basin uh, for alfalfa seed pollination for the seed crop of alfalfa. And uh, man, they, they kind of are in aspects, if you're not a producer producing alfalfa seed, they can be kind of a pest because they just fly off and make nests. Uh, so for instance, on my trailer plug, they've filled those holes full of, of leaf material and that. And so they get into those little holes and cracks and if, if it's an important part, like a wire for the, the trailer, it, it, it can be cumbersome, but yeah, or, they're pretty, the, pretty amazing. Or the orifice for a barbecue, they'll fill those yeah. up. That, that yeah. type of stuff happens. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, the, well, and then there's some of them that, uh, that they plug it with dirt and, and stuff. So they, uh, okay. there are you know, mason bees and, and uh, those types of things that can, uh, mud daubers, uh, you know, they aren't, uh, uh, they usually are more, obvious on those but certainly and then leaf cutter bees can be problematic uh with their defoliation uh usually plants that are healthy and otherwise unstressed can withstand quite a bit of defoliation and i try to give them a pass i've tried to come up with uh, what would be like a sacrificial annual that you could grow that they would like the leaves of because they really seem to prefer certain textures you know lilacs and roses and those types of things i'll, I'll see them get hit uh, and so uh, I was uh, consulting with a lady one time. She had a service berry bush that was really getting hammered by leaf cutters. And uh, I did some research and tried to find some alternative annuals that she could plant that maybe would be uh, uh, better and, and divert them from her, her service berry. So uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I followed up with her and she said she finally gave up on the service berry and didn't plant the annuals either. So. <laughs> But it's an idea. Yeah. So you had mentioned wasps are also in this family. Is that correct, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. The order Hymenoptera is very big. There's uh, the ones that you know, we consider those uh, stinging wasps and then the non-stinging wasps. And, and I'll, I'll cover those. Because some of these, you know, uh, uh, the females uh, can uh, have a sting. Uh, I but uh, they're not uh, very aggressive and certainly uh, you know when they're out gathering uh, uh, plant material uh, you know they're not looking to sting anybody. Uh, the other hymenopterans uh, that can visit flowers uh, this is a, uh, a soft fly which are uh, plant feeding members of the hymenoptera and that uh, a lot of times the lar larva soft flies uh, will feed on leaf material. Uh, instead of like pollen or nectar that's provisioned for them. Uh, but the, the adults will often visit flowers and like on this pistor. In, in the case, this is a little tiny little alpine buttercup. And so this is, uh, uh, I, I guess the best I could say is a, a calcidoidea, 
uh, one of the really small uh, non-stinging wasps that go after other insects' eggs is what I, uh, based on some of the features that you can see in the photo. Most of those you have to look at them under a microscope to really identify them uh, uh, very far. And so again, uh, you know, a lot of things visit flowers and, and depend on them. Uh, the hunting wasps do it too. And they're called hunting, hunting wasps because they will uh, search out things like grasshoppers or caterpillars and, and sting and paralyze them and then take them back to a hole that they've dug in the ground and then lay their egg on it. Uh, and, but the adults will feed on uh, nectar. Uh, and you can see in this case, it's just covered with pollen. Uh, and, and, and so again, they can be uh, uh, good pollinators. <clears throat> includes some of the ones that uh, maybe are not our favorites, things like paper wasps and yellow jackets will visit some flowers that have, produce a lot of nectar. Uh, but you have some like the mason wasps and the pollen wasp subfamilies that are in Vespidae uh, are good pollinators. And so like the, the pollen wasps are once they have this really unique structure on the ends of their antenna uh, that help identify them. Yeah. <clears throat> but many other the insects that visit flowers also mimic wasp coloration for protection because uh, you know that's uh, say a bird that's been stung by a, a yellow jacket when it try to feed on it will hesitate instead of grabbing this insect. Uh, it's called mimicry. You can see here uh, it's feeding on nectar, but in the process it's getting pollen off this gentian. Uh, there's another true fly that uh, visits uh, uh, flowers. Uh, a family is Tachinidae, and, and these are uh, totally beneficial flies in that uh, they help control the populations of other insects like grasshoppers or caterpillars. They do that as adults by laying an egg on them, and then the egg hatches and bores into uh, the host insect and will eventually kill them. The adults feed on nectar and, and pollen and, and in the process can help transfer it with their hairy bodies and like tramping around on flowers. Uh, bee flies, uh, this time of year when the sunflowers are going, you'll often see this, this little guy here uh, feeding uh, with her proboscis. It looks like you know it's something dangerous, but that they're totally harmless to humans. Uh, it's just for nectar feeding. Wait, it's a big, it's a big fuzzy mosquito, right, Scott? <laughs> yeah, they when are. I was a kid, I thought they were a cross between a mosquito and a woolly mammoth. You know? <laughs> 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 they are. They're a, they're an interesting looking insect, but. Yeah, totally harmless, but they got that big proboscis. It looks like a beak or a like almost like a surgical needle, really, on the end of them. But yeah, they, I the first time I saw those, those were uh, very shocking to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those things. You it's like, oh, well, I hope that that's not a big uh, you know cold weather mosquito or something. <laughs> well, they're they're harmless, and and in some cases, uh, some of the species. Uh, help control the populations of grasshoppers because they'll lay their eggs uh, where uh, the grasshopper egg pods are and then the larva will bore down into it and, and eat the grasshopper eggs. Boy, we need a few more of those this year then. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that complaint from a lot of the state. Uh, diptera, the two flies, also includes the mosquitoes and uh, the mosquitoes, you know, uh, the females are, uh, require blood meals to um, uh, produce their eggs or in, in quantity, but both the males and the females will feed on nectar for carbohydrates as an energy source. Uh, but they're not considered very effective pollinators uh, uh, you know, based on behavior and, and revisiting flowers of the same species and transferring pollen. They're just not considered very effective, but certainly uh, they do utilize flowers, and this is a, a native thistle, and it's just covered with uh, uh, the mosquitoes. There wasn't much else blooming that year out on the prairie for them to feed on, so uh, the native thistles and the western wallflower was about it for them. You know you're hard up when you have to feed on thistles. <laughs> 
Well, I've got a horse that could be a biocontrol agent for this. <laughs> <laughs> he, he pulls his lips back, you know, so he doesn't get stuck in the lips and grabs it and crunches those seed heads. And like, oh, <laughs> Something to look forward to. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So the uh, butterflies and moths, like Jeremiah was talking about traditionally, because, you know, you see them a lot on flowers. Uh, you think of them, oh, yeah, they'll be a pollinator. And, of course, uh, many of them are. They're effective. Uh, but the way, you know, they're both in the same order, Lepidoptera, which means scale wing, which is just how they get the color and pattern on their wings. It's like a little mosaic, little tiny colored scales. Uh, but we separate them into suborders of butterflies and, and then moths. There's actually a lot more moths than there are butterflies. The butterflies all have clubbed antenna, and then they hold their wings. Let's see. Well, I guess, I guess I'll go back here. The moths have variable antenna, but never clubbed. So they can be thread-like or feathery or plumose. And then the wings are folded uh, at rest vertically on the butterfly, and most of the time on the moths, it's shingle-like, horizontal. <clears throat> So the brush-footed butterflies are ones real common that we see on our flowers, and they like the, the flowers that are, I think, umbral is the proper term, kind of a flat shape like uh, yarrow or other types of things. So they can they can walk around on them easily, and then they unfurl their proboscis and can feed on the tubular uh, flowers and, and get nectar. And in the process, they'll transfer pollen, and and uh, many times they, they test the suitability of the flower. They dip down with their modified front legs and, and test. And you can see they're all brushy and hairy. That would be good for transferring pollen. So these are some of the common species that we see uh, uh, around on flowers here in Wyoming. Uh, certainly, you know, painted ladies come through and, and lay eggs. And, and uh, they, uh, uh, in most cases, they're beneficial because uh, they uh, like to lay their eggs on thistles, and so that helps control the populations of thistles. In some years when they're really abundant, they can be a, actually a pest on things like uh, uh, bean crops. Uh, uh, commas are, are a really neat uh, early season butterfly that you can see up in the forest, checker spots, fritillaries, uh, a lot of different species. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people like to take photos of them because they're so beautiful, and then also the setting for them is often very beautiful. One of, one of my favorite insects are the white-lined hawk moth, uh, kind of an insect hummingbird in their behavior. Uh, they like to visit tubular flowers. Uh, if you ever get a chance to visit the UW campus in late summer uh, and, and walk around in uh, the evening uh, before it gets really dark, you'll often see many of these uh, visiting the, the flowers that they've got in the the landscaping on campus. You know, you always got to keep in mind, you know, we, we really like the insects that pollinate, but the larvae sometimes chew on our plants. And in, in one year when I was doing research out on the prairie near Lingle, uh, it was a great year for uh, the hot white line uh, hawk moth. And, and they have very coloration on their caterpillars. And so I gathered them all up and put them on a nice background, their old cow patty, to show the, the variation there. And, and the, the plant, the, the plant that really fired this up was, it was a year when the, the hillsides early in the spring looked white. It was the prairie primrose. And so the, uh, the ones that had overwintered uh, uh, as pupa in the soil emerged and they had a bountiful supply of food and also food for the larva because the larva like to feed on this uh, primrose too. So again, you got to keep in mind, you know, if, if you're going to have uh, pollinators, you got to provide uh, all of the habitat needs, not just for the adults, but also for the larva too. That's one of the biggest challenges, or, or can be a challenge with, so we, we have a few shows that have talked about pollinator friendly plots or or pollinator friendly flowers and how to, to benefit those pollinators but you also got to be able to tolerate the other life cycles yeah. of of that pollinator as well and uh just like we've talked about you know bees wasps you know certain types of wasp are um here at my house we don't 
we don't we're not very kind to wasps we we really don't like them uh and and they're just constantly building not nests on the house and that and so we we try and keep a buffer zone around our where we're going to spend most of our time outdoors but then the rest of the property we don't try and control them necessarily there but yeah it, it's tricky and, and it's a de delicate balance with those uh with the insects as always yeah yeah well it's certainly you know uh, i don't think you're you're uh going to hurt the pollinator population by reducing you know like the ground nesting yellow jackets the, the western yellow jacket or the aerial yellow jackets and like to get up under your eaves those those are really uh kind of more of a nuisance pest in those situations because they're they're they're, they're very defensive about the nest and will readily sting uh whereas you know the providing the other habitat uh, for your uh, you know, like your ground nesting bees and those types of things you know that's uh certainly uh you know, stuff to keep in mind as you're doing your landscaping so, you, dis uh, you discourage wasps just like you discourage uh, broccoli, right, Jeremiah? Yes, heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Probably even more so than broccoli, though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Scott, please go on. No, no problem. So uh, uh, one of the other ones that we might not think of as being pollinators are the coleoptera, the beetles. And uh, many of them are classed as what are called mess and soil pollinators in that they'll you know, they all have chewing mat, uh, mouth parts, the mandibles, and, and so they are not, you know, not delicate nectar feeders like a butterfly or a moth. They get on there, and many of the flowers that are adapted to uh, uh, being pollinated by them often have sacrificial, you know, parts that they can chew on, and, and uh, you know, it won't interfere with the pollination. And, and so, like, the flower longhorn beetles are ones, they often have a very hairy thorax, to help transfer pollen between flowers. And uh, they'll visit uh, multiple flowers and, and chew on parts of them and, and get the pollination done for them. You also have uh, things like the, uh, uh, you know, the checkered beetles that uh, are, are ones that visit flowers uh, uh, and, and chew on them. You can see here, they, you know, this, this is an ornate checkered beetle. They are, are beautiful. Uh, they, they also have a lot of variation in the uh, color, uh, uh, but uh, they are pretty common on flowers if you look for them. Uh, they, uh, you know, in this case, you know, this one's chewed off some of the anthers on this little flax flower. And then the other thing that they'll do is uh, utilize the uh, flower as a place to put their egg, which will then hatch and then hitch a ride on, say, a ground nesting bee that visits that uh, flower and back to its uh, nest where it's provisioning and, and then we'll uh, essentially hijack that bee's uh, provisions and kill its larva uh, and, and, and that's how this particular checkered beetle reproduces. So again, uh, kind of an interesting thing and just to keep in mind, you know, the flowers can actually be a dangerous place for insects because, you know, it's an attraction to them and so you can have uh, predators like ambush bugs or, or crab spiders that will hang out on the flowers and, and get the insects when they come to them. Or in this case, here, here's a, a, a species of blister beetle, and uh, it will also lay eggs that will hatch out, and the larvae uh, that first hatch out are called triangulants. They're active, and they will crawl up onto, uh, say, in this case, this is an orchid bee, and they will get up on them and then hitch a ride back to where they're trying to nest at. So it's a, a, like say, it's kind of a dangerous uh, a place, but it, it's nature. You know, there's predation and, and uh, things like that going on. Uh, I think uh, for us, uh, you know, providing lots of flowers and, and some of the habitat to help support them you know, if, if there's abundant flowers, uh, you'll have abundant pollinators. And yeah, you're also going to support populations of their predators, but that that's important too, you know, keep nature in balance. Yeah, we need to have that whole ecosystem and that whole um, component of the symbiosis and the parasit uh, parasitism and everything that happens in that to keep it functioning accurately and, and correctly and balancing itself to a degree. Um, yeah, and and you can't provide one without the other. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the, the thing. You know, you're trying to uh, 
in a way, you know, mimic uh, Mother Nature and, and provide a lot more uh, diversity of plants. You know, you, if you look at, say, just a bluegrass lawn with an you know, evergreen shrub on it, it's, it's pretty much a pollinator desert. And so if you can do things, you know, put in flower beds or, and have uh, plants that at least a part of the year uh, provide blossoms and, and uh, food for these insects that, you know, they'll take advantage of. It's amazing how uh, far they will go to find uh, resources. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, like I said, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Jenny Thompson, uh, we, we all uh, worked on uh, uh, the promoting pollinators on your place. Mm, yeah. That one's not showing up today. Yeah, yeah. There it is. There it is. <laughs> yeah. So this book has some information on, on uh, supporting pollinators and uh, what you can do. I have a real challenge with uh, getting flowers season long. Uh, it, it seems to be difficult right now. Uh, this blanket flower that's here on the picture—that's uh, one of the few flowers I've got still going. So uh, again, there's lots of good information out there. Another one, if you, if you like looking at flowers and like looking at the insects that visit them, this is a recent publication from the, the Berry Biodiversity Center. Uh, it is available for $13 shipped. Uh, a really nice uh, publication on the native bees of Wyoming. So it's kind of a pocket guide, has distribution and how to, how to identify a lot of our, our bees, uh, the members of that super family of Poidia. Uh, that, uh, At the end of the show, we'll show you where there's some links where you can get, um, especially the Pollinator Pub, you can just download it and have it on your computer if you want, or device. Yeah, get access to those good resources. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. So it's, uh, like I said, I, I, I went through it fairly fast. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer them. Um, uh, part of my job is identification of insects, and it's probably the part of my job I enjoy the most. Uh, you can uh, send me photos at this email address, insectid at uwio.edu, and uh, uh, please include information about where you took the photo and what the insect was doing, and uh, uh, try to get it clear uh, and focus. I can fix other things like exposure or, or, or those types of things, but uh, I can't really fix focus. And I'll try to identify it for you. Uh, if I can't identify it, I'll find somebody who can. And uh, so with that, are there any uh, questions? You mentioned uh, like various parasites and stuff that hitch a ride and on flowers and go back with bees to their nests and affects their nests. I, it was my understanding that there are types of bees that actually prey on other bees. Is that correct? Yeah, there's uh, uh, one of the, the prettiest ones uh, uh, is it's, uh, it's not a, uh, a bee per se, uh, but one of the, the prettiest ones is the cuckoo wasp. They are metallic greens, similar to the halictids, uh, really sculpted if you look at them closely. And, and they have uh, extremely strong exoskeleton because they will sneak into the nests of these ground nesting bees and the, and the bees will, if they catch them, will try to bite them. And so these cuckoo bees uh, uh, will fold up uh, into a ball and uh, protect themselves so they don't have any parts out that can be bit off by the mad bee. <laughs> and, uh, but then there's also even uh, a lot of things going on in the, in the world where they uh, like uh, uh, the species of bumblebees that uh, will uh, uh, sneak into the colonies of other species and then take them over. They'll kill the original queen and then they have the ability to convince her daughters that, hey, I'm the new queen, you need to, just, to serve me. And so then they'll assist in raising the super uh, offspring. So, um, yeah, the insect- Your mother doesn't live here anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it's, uh, it's, it, uh, I guess you'd say, instead of a doggy doggy world out there, it's an insect, insect world out there. And all sorts That's of for sure. <laughs> I was reading about leaf cut. I think it was leaf cutters that put their nests. They make little nest cells, like he was talking about, in twigs or in um, 
stumps and things. And so they'll, they'll have a, one, there'll be one nest cell and then they'll put another one in front of it and then another one in front of it until they work their way back out the hole. And so what I was reading was that they often put the females, so the bees are able to control what sex their offspring are gonna be, which is pretty interesting. And so they'll put the female ones in the back of the nest. And then at the very front, they'll have the males because if their predator comes along or a parasitoid, they won't be able to reach the females. And they usually give the females more food and stuff. And so they've invested more in those females. And so they're a little better protected. Sorry, Sacrifice males. Sacrifice the males. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't take many males. And then the other thing, too, that the males will come out and won't be in the way of the females when they start emerging. Yeah, that, it's pretty interesting that, you know, the triggers are the timing, how that works. So it's, uh, <laughs> well, now, do, like, other pollinators, so I'm, I'm, let's talk bees, but since we're talking about that, but do, do bees protect their food sources? Like, and I'm thinking, like, European honeybees, will, will one colony protect their food source from another colony and that? Do you see that relationship going on out there as well? Yeah, there, there's, uh, uh, they can be defensive uh, about their resources, even butterflies, male butterflies can defend the territory from other butterflies. Uh, but uh, there's like, uh, let's see, I think, isn't it the wool carter bee, Jeff, that has, they actually have spikes on their abdomen and will uh, you know, defend uh, uh, flowers and grab uh, insects that are trying to visit and, and stab them with those spikes? I believe so. Yeah. So, so yeah, there is that, that you know, it is a resource. And that's the other thing you have to keep in mind if you, uh, you know, are raising honeybees too on your uh, property. You know, the honeybees uh, uh, are very efficient in uh, gathering the resources, and you know, plants only can produce so much uh, nectar and pollen, uh, so they will be competing with the, the natives. Uh, so, so, yeah, I have to keep that in mind. Now, there are some flowers, certainly things like uh, you know, uh, tomato blossoms or, or, or other things like that, are not attractive to bees at all because they don't uh, do the, the buzz pollination and there's no nectar on the tomato flower. Uh, that's the other thing to keep in mind too, if you're planting flowers, is you want to utilize uh, flowers that do provide nectar and pollen resources because there are some things like, uh, you know, the, the, say the, I think was the double petunias and, and other stuff that have been selected. They may look pretty, but they don't provide much in the way of resources for our insect friends. Well, and it's really, uh, as I'm listening to you, Scott, it's really just balancing that, right? Providing the right food source for the right pollinators that you have in the area. And so learning them together really benefits you if you're wanting to provide great habitat for pollinators. Uh, the best example I can think of, I've listened to Jenny talk, and uh, any like trumpet-type flower, right? Long tubular flower, very much like a penstemon flower. Uh, you're going to need a, a pollinator that has a long proboscis to to access that nectar and get into that flower. Um, other other pollinators might struggle with that type of structure of flower. So um, planting the right flower structure, the timing of those flowers, but also knowing what pollinators are even in your area will will matter for how you cultivate for pollinators or benefit pollinators in your area. Well, and to go along with that, Jeremiah, you guys don't, in your area, don't use honeybees to pollinate alfalfa. You use leafcutter bees because the way that the nectaries are accessed, uh, it triggers a, is that the anther, Scott, that wax them on the back? The whole and, style, stigma. Yeah, style and, and honeybees, yeah. that irritates honeybees. They don't like that very much. The, uh, the leafcutter bees don't seem to mind. And I think uh, honeybees will actually, um, if they get irritated enough, will chew through the bottom of the flower and avoid the anther altogether and be robbing the nectar and, and then not pollinating it. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, we have a lot of honeybees up here. So the space to produce commercial honeybees is all taken up for the entire Bighorn Basin. And those are usually, if I remember correctly, on a two mile radius between hives, uh, spots where they place the hives. Uh, but yeah, the, the alfalfa producer, alfalfa seed producers uh, actually cultivate, incubate, 
manage those leaf cutter bees and then have bee releases. They actually go out and release those those leaf cutters into the field for that very reason that you talked about, Jeff. Uh, so we actually have both in the area, but specifically for pollination of the crop, the producers are releasing those leaf cutter bees and cultivating them for future years. And right. it's weird, right? I, I was not aware of this until I got into this position, but leaf cutter bees are actually a commercial commodity. And right. so they are sold and traded uh, very much like any other agriculture commodity that we have. And so it's just fascinating. If you ever want to see that trigger mechanism in alfalfa, you can just find an alfalfa plant and pull up a flower and poke it with like a toothpick or something and watch that stigma style come whack them out. It comes at great force. So it's pretty amazing. Insects can tolerate that. Well, and from what I understand, like on the, the European honeybees, that stigma coming out just beats them up and, and it's pretty rough on them. And if I understand it correctly, Scott, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it actually can shorten their lifespan uh, from that kind of abuse if they take too much of it too often. Whereas the leaf cutter bees are a little bit smaller of a bee and they can avoid getting beat up too much and they tend to be a little more aggressive and so they don't mind it as much either I think but yeah it's, it's probably a you know a modification because the the alfalfa leaf cutter bee actually comes it was imported from the uh, well it wasn't actually imported initially on purpose but it got here anyway and then it has been propagated in it they're very expensive to buy and that's uh, uh, you know a major expense for the pollination chores but the I, they, they probably have some adaptation so it doesn't you know hurt or or, or you know, in some way uh, bother them that much whereas a honeybee you know maybe they do they take a beating it is funny it's like uh, you know we have uh, multiple species of bumblebees in the state and you think well they all visit flowers right well you know you have short tongue ones and medium tongue ones and long tongue ones and some of them are real active early in the season and kind of uh, they, they go, um, you know, their life cycle such that the colony ends early and others go late. And I had uh, submissions from Lusk this year because uh, people were buying the petunia baskets and putting them out relatively early in the spring. And they were complaining about the bumblebees chewing them up. And, and they finally sent me a couple of the bumblebees and they were Bombus grizzicolus. And they're considered uh, a short tongue uh, uh, bee. And they, what they were doing is, you know, they couldn't get into these petunias to get to what they wanted. And so they were, they were chewing up the flowers to get to the, the uh, nectar and, and, and you know, what they were searching out. So, yeah, it's crazy, really fascinating. Uh, Scott shared with me, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, um, that alkali bees in back in I believe it was the 1950s up in Fremont County and probably up here in the Bighorn Basin that producers actually used alkali bees and encouraged alkali bee nesting ground um, to pollinate alfalfa seed and those those native bees pollinated the crops for those producers back in that time period that was before they brought leaf cutter bees in to pollinate the crops from my understanding um, but then uh, because of disease, but also I think of pesticides, that was uh, the reason for decline of those native pollinators for that use. Uh, we still have those alkali bees in the area and, and there has been some questions to me and that's what stimulated that question to Scott of, of how do you propagate those alkali bees? Um, and how, you know, can we get some benefit from native pollinators and not rely so heavily on leaf cutter bees and use them kind of dual purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I tried to get some funding to do some research because they actually use them out there in the, uh, I think it's uh, pronounced Touche Valley in Washington state. They uh, uh, extension uh, back in the fifties figured out what were the requirements to make an alkali bee bed. And, and because the alkali bees are even better pollinators than the leaf cutter bees are in the alfalfa. They, they get a heavier seed set. And then also if you have a, a bee, uh, alkali bee propagation site, they're self reproducing. You, other than maybe applying enough water to get the alkali uh, in, in soil moisture right for them, uh, you don't have to buy them. They'll, they'll uh, propagate. Uh, 
themselves. And, and so, um, yeah, for some reason, the alkali bees really faded out. Uh, I've been trying to get people to find them. You know, people will often say, oh, I've got some out here uh, on, on this bare ground. But, you know, it, it's, in the cases I've had submitted to me uh, or samples collected were digger bees. Uh, uh, they weren't the alkali bees because they are very specific on the kind of soil uh, and, and moisture conditions that they utilize. And I have not found any, even though we do have alkali mud flats in a lot of the state. I don't know what happened to the poor things, but uh, uh, you know, it would be, it, it'd probably take some funding and, and some real searching. Uh, but I was surprised because initially I thought, oh yeah, this will be easy. We can, maybe we can start our own alkali bees up again. In, uh, uh, and you can see pictures of those alkali bees um, in that manual that Scott shared before. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you where you can find those. So if you go to our website, the Barnyards and Backyards website, and you go down here, we have a list of all the different kind of subject matter that we cover. There's one that says pollinator guide. If you pull that up, you can find this page and if you click on that it'll pull down the whole guide for you and it's this one but we also have a lot of other great things that you can utilize on here as well and one of them is for identification so if you're into butterflies and moth this bonoma site from north Amer butterflies and moths in north america is really cool because you can click on a particular butterfly or moth that you are interested in that is native to our area and then you can look up things like what types of plants does it live on? So that caterpillar part of the life cycle, what does it need to chew on for that? We have others, and including this one is a guide to the bumblebees of uh, Western US. And that's a link to the native bee guide that he was showing as well. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff on here, including we have a section in the guide that is about all the different plants um, that you can grow to help support pollinators and including, so these are the different plant kind of featured information on how big they grow and how wide and that kind of thing. And then in the middle of the guide, we actually have a little calendar kind of thing that can show you, sorry, I'm moving around so much, hope I'm not making you all sick, that shows when the different plants bloom. So you can schedule out if you're interested and have certain plants blooming in certain parts of the year, which can be handy if you're trying to um, change your landscape and make it so that it's a little more pollinator friendly. So those are just a couple of things you'll find on that page. Great. I appreciate it, Jenny. And with that, I don't think there's any other questions. So thank you so much, Scott. Thanks for joining us. What a great show. Um, tons of information. And definitely, I encourage everybody to reach out to Scott, uh, utilize his services. I, I know I personally appreciate all his support that he provides me. Uh, the identification in, in particular really is just helpful, but then just the fascinating information that he has on various insects and it doesn't only have to be pollinators yeah i think scott enjoys any insect that comes across his desk so again thank you so much scott you're welcome you're welcome and with that yeah so jenny highlighted the barnyards and backyards website and so please join us there look up there anything you uh if you want to know about more of this barnyards and backyards live show if you if you want to watch this one again or past recordings we will post them up there uh so just go on to that website uh also we have a list and we are planning to continue barnyards and backyards live webs uh, shows here until through September then we're going to probably take a little break is what we're looking at and we will start back up next winter uh, December January time period we haven't determined that but keep watching that website we're going to post up the schedule once we have those and move forward if you have questions about pollinators you want to get a, a a pollinator guide or anything that way or have questions or have a sample to submit you can reach out to your local extension office so we have an extension office in every county in the state and one on the wind river indian reservation and so reach out to us we're here to help you and, and try and answer those questions best you can we can also help connect you to uh, specialists like scott down on campus uh, that have just these specific talents and, and interests that really help 
us out here in the state and, and to help you as a client. So please reach out, use those resources. The last thing, I believe Jenny's already done it, but she's posted uh, the URL, a link for an evaluation for us to do this show and to make sure that we're on target and helping you, please fill out that evaluation share with us. Um, for those of you in Zoom, it might be in the chat box, or you once you close out, it, you'll be prompted in a URL to fill out that, that evaluation. It's a very simple, I think, five question survey. So if you wouldn't mind taking some time and giving us that information, really appreciate it. And with that, again, thank you so much, Scott. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for all our participants and joining us. Everybody have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thanks, Scott.